Welcome to the Simply Thick live webinar, Itsy Food Prep. My name is Liz Fiala, and I will be your moderator today. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to take care of some housekeeping notes. At the end of the webinar, you will have an opportunity to ask questions. Enter them in the Q&A box on your screen anytime during the presentation. We plan to go for two hours and have allotted for 15 minutes of questions at the end. There will also be a prize raffle after the Q&A, so be sure to stay until the very end to be eligible to win a free prize. As a reminder, speech-language pathologists will receive 0.2 CEUs after completing a short quiz on CEUespresso.com. Certified dietary managers will receive two CEUs and a certificate of completion after completing and passing the online quiz sent to you. You were emailed quiz instructions as well as a copy of the quiz so that you can follow along during today's presentation. Registered dietitians and diet techs will receive two CEUs and a certificate of completion for your files within one week. Please note that sometimes these emails get stuck in your spam folder. If you do not see the email with your certificate or quiz instructions within the next week, we recommend checking your spam first. Only speech language pathologists and certified dietary managers are required to take the quiz. Please be aware that we have made small updates to the slide handouts. If you'd like to receive an updated copy of the handouts after this webinar, feel free to email us at itsy at simplythick.com. Last but not least, this webinar will be recorded for future viewing. However, only participants who are registered for and attended our live webinar will be eligible for CEUs. Now, I would like to introduce our speakers. John Hollihan is the president and founder of Simply Thick and an inaugural member of the ITSI Hall of Appreciation. He is also a member of the Canadian ITSI Reference Group and a founder of the U.S. ITSI Reference Group. Inventor of the company's patented thickener, Simply Thick, Mr. Hollihan has worked with thickeners and not just in healthcare for his entire business career. Lori Berger is a regional manager for Simply Thick in the Midwest region. She works with acute, long-term care, and chain accounts, as well as distribution and home health care customers by educating on dysphagia, presenting on ITSI, and teaching uses of Simply Thick. Lori has worked in the dysphagia area for 21 years. She earned her Bachelor of Science degree in Dietetics and Restaurant Hotel Management from Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana and her Master's of Business Administration with a marketing emphasis from Webster University in St. Louis, Missouri. Lori is a member of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and the Missouri Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Now, without further ado, let's get started with the ITSI webinar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our ITSY Food Demo webinar. I'm Laurie Berger, and I'm going to get us started today. Let's go through the agenda first. So we're in the midst of our intro housekeeping and speaker introductions, and then we're going to do 10 minutes on the it's a review of the ITSY test methods. Then um, we'll review extremely thick stock for five minutes, and then you're going to get over an hour's worth of food demos. Then we'll do 15 minutes of liquid demos, and we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. Disclosure statements for me and for John. Um, Simply Thick is a financial supporter of ITSI, but we have no input or content on the content or direction of ITSI. The learner objectives for today. After watching the presentation, you'll be able to use the ITSI test methods to test the current items in your facility. You're gonna learn how to use extremely thick stock to adjust for the natural vari variability in raw food and food prep. We're gonna prepare a bread product that complies with ITSI standards, and you'll be able to articulate the difference between a descriptive diet like ITSI and a prescriptive diet like the National Dysphagia Diet. So now I'll turn it over to John and he'll tell you a little fun fact, a few fun facts about himself. 
Hey folks, welcome. Glad to have you here. <clears throat> Want to give you just a couple interesting facts about me. Uh, even though I work here in the dysphagia industry and I've been here for 22 years, I actually have a degree in paper engineering. And one of the hobbies that I've taken on over the last few years is that I make soap at home. I uh, clean up bacon fat and then I turn that into soap. So I've been using that for a few years. I am married to my college sweetheart. We have three kids, one girl and two boys. You can see in our family holiday photo from last year that uh, they kind of tower over us at this point. Over the years, we've hosted two exchange students and we have hosted 14 uh, foster dogs as well. Uh, I currently am an active Boy Scout leader. And in the lower right there, you'll see a picture of me with my two sons on the top of Mount Phillips in July of 2021 at Philmont Scout Ranch. Uh, my younger son and I are returning there this summer. And I'm also an inaugural member of the ITSE Hall of Appreciation. And now I'm going to turn it back to Lori so you can learn a little bit more about her. Thanks, John. So a little bit about me. You probably know already um, my undergrad degree is in nutrition and dietetics. I enjoy learning and I'm, I'm enrolled for the fifth time at Washington University Mini Medical School. I've worked in dysphagia for a long time and I love my sports. And there's my dog and there's a picture of me in Antarctica. So um, that's a little bit about me. Now... Let's learn a little bit about you and take a couple minutes and have you participate in the professional poll. All right, everyone, we'll give you about 20 seconds or so to fill out that poll answer, and then we'll take a look at who we have with us today. All right, and we're going to go ahead and end that poll. We have most everyone's responses at this point. Let's take a look at what we have. Wow, it looks like we have a lot of speech language pathologists joining us, almost 50%. We're at 44% speech language pathologist, 2% OTs, 39% RDs, 12% CDMs, and then some mixed professions and diet techs as well as students. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Liz. So now let's talk about the eight ITSE test methods. So we'll actually be doing six of these today. And really what you need to know, the ITSE test methods you're going to see are pretty simple. And they're done with three tools, a fork, a spoon, and a funnel or a syringe. So that's what we'll be going through um, throughout the webinar. So I talked briefly about the ITSE funnel, and I'll be demonstrating that to you in just a few minutes, and we'll talk more about it, but it is available for purchase at the Simply Thick website. So this was included in your ITSE kit, and this is a simple testing reference guide. This really pulls it all together for you for the testing methods. So I think you can follow along with this, and you can see how we're doing the testing. Another very good reference for you is the audit sheets. And this is an example of one that's minced and moist. It gives you the critical tests on the sheet. And it also asks you to test at the time of service, 15 minutes after and 30 minutes after. So this is a very good resource that you can get from the ITSE website. We're also gonna be using the ITSE cutting board template today. And um, this is what it looks like. And you can actually purchase this from the from the Simply Thick website if you're interested. But we'll be using this in our testing throughout the webinar. We also have a handled food form that's available on our website. I wanted to show you a picture. I'll be using that a little later in the webinar. Now I'm going to turn it to John. Hey, folks, John Hollihan. Really excited here. To, to tell you about our new cookbook that's gonna launch next month on uh, March 1st is the official launch date. And just a little bit of history behind this is three years ago, we had a bunch of people sitting at home without a lot to do. And we thought, well, let's update our recipes and get them you know, so they're ITSE test method compliant and, and include that with all of our recipes. And then as we worked through the process and we got done with it, we realized that there was still an absence there. And that was 
a way for people at home to fully understand what the ITSI methods are and how to process things to ITSI. So we've taken all of our recipes, we put them together in this book. It's a little bit different than a traditional cookbook because we don't tell you how to make the chicken. We tell you how to take that chicken and turn it into a level four, level five, or level six food the way you want. So you can season it the way you want and you can make it the way that you're used to at home. We're really super excited to finally have this product on the market. It's really the end of like a two or three year crazy process. And we're really excited to announce that it is now available and, and our hard launch date is coming up March 1st. Okay, hi everyone, Laurie again. So what we're gonna do first is I'm gonna do an intro to ITZY for you. And what we're gonna do is I made some chicken in advance and I'm gonna teach you how to use the cutting board and how to see if your chicken is um, compliant with ITZY. So we're gonna look at my cutting board and I'm gonna show you what I did. So I didn't mention before, we are not going to be wearing gloves today because we're not gonna be eating the food. So you'll see us using our hands and I wanted to let you know that. So with the cutting board, on here are the critical tests for levels four, five, and six. So what I did is I bought some chicken that was pre-cooked and I cut it to the correct size for level six soft and bite-sized. So you can see here that it's fitting right in those squares. Those squares are 15 by 15 by 15 millimeters for adults. Now also the size can equal your thumbnail or the width of a fork. And so those are a few ways that you can measure 15 by 15 by 15, but this makes it really simple. We, it also notes that there should be no separate thin liquids with level six. So there's a couple tests that we wanna do. We wanna do the fork spoon pressure test. So we wanna press on one of these, it doesn't really matter which one, and wanna do it until our thumbnail blanches to white, and then the chicken should not return to its original shape. So that looks like, it looks pretty good. Then we're also wanna be able to cut off a piece so we know that the chicken or whatever food we're doing is tender enough. So that cut rather easily. So that would pass level six. Now next, I have we have minced and moist. And so I made some minced and moist chicken and I'm gonna show you a little later how to make the minced and moist chicken and how I did it. But for now, we're just gonna go over the critical tests and the cutting board. So for minced and moist, we know the size is four by four by 15 for adults. So that would be between the tines of the fork. And also you, you wanna push down, like you see there's little orange squares and that's the correct size. We wanna make sure that the food comes through the, the tines of the fork, so that would pass. Now, also, we do not want separate liquid, so we want to make sure that the that it doesn't drip through. I'm going to just try to turn that to the side so you can see that nothing is dripping through the minced and moist chicken. And then also, we want to do the spoon tilt test. So I'm going to grab a spoon, and then what I want to do is I want to flick it off, and it should come off rather easily. So a little hint you that I can teach you is if you hold your elbow and then you flick, that way you'll only use your wrist and you won't use your whole arm because you don't wanna do it too hard. So those are the testing for minced and moist. Now we're gonna to go to puree. So now I took it to puree and we wanna make sure that there are no lumps and there's no separate thin liquid. So to do this, we're gonna take a fork and we wanna make sure that nothing drips through again. So I'm gonna turn it to the side. You can see nothing is dripping through. And also next we wanna take a spoon and we wanna make sure we can do the spoon tilt test again. So it should come right off. And that way, you know that it did pass for the puree critical tests. So that gave you a summary of using the cutting board and using your chicken. So the, I'll show you how to make it later and we're also gonna show you how to make a lot of other items today. So now I wanna go to show you how, talk a little bit about the funnel and the, the funnel and the syringes. And I'm gonna talk to you about both of them. So the funnels are still pretty new and you have a funnel in your kit so you can see it close up.
And then in the past, and many of you still may be using the syringes. I'm gonna demonstrate both, but I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the advantages of the funnel, because it's really cool. With the funnel, you only need to use one funnel. With the syringe, you need to use two. So there's a lot less materials, there's a lot less waste if you use the funnel. Also, the top of the funnel's big, so you can just pour the liquid right into the funnel. Whereas with the syringes, you really need to use two because the top's not very big. So there's a lot more, there's less waste using this, the, the funnel. It's more durable and there's less cleanup using it. So let me tell you a couple of things before I do some testing for you. In your kit, you've got um, a BD 10 milliliter, 10, 10 milliliter syringe. And if you decide you're going to use syringes, it's reference number 303134 is what you would want to purchase. You also have a care touch syringe in your box. This is one that is non-compliant. So if you're going to be doing some ITSY testing, that's not one that you want to use. Okay, so let's do let's do the syringes first. So what I've done is I've thickened this orange juice to mildly thick. And I'm going to pour my orange juice. Oh, nope, I'm not going to do that. Now, that's not my funnel. I'm going to put it in my syringe. I forgot we were going to start with the syringe. And I'm going to pull it up in my syringe. And then I'm going to fill up the syringe with the other syringe. Okay, to the 10 milliliter line. And then I'm going to check and make sure it's right on the 10 milliliter line. And then I've got a timer that I'm going to time it for 10 seconds. And let's do that. And we'll see how much is left. Okay. So I've got oh, a little over six. And if we look at, you have this ITSY flow test card in your, there we go, in your kit. And what you can do is for, it's, this is a little bit more cumbersome to use the syringes, but you can hold the syringe right up. And you can see between four and eight milliliters would be four mildly thick, and that's how it would have passed, okay? So you can use that. Also on the other side, it tells you how to do the ITSY flow test. Next, let's use the funnel. And you're gonna see this is a lot easier. So I'm just gonna take my orange juice and pour it right in to the line, which is the 10 milliliter line. So I have a little too much in there. I'm gonna let a little out. I'm right at the line. And if you look at the syringe, it's marked for level one, mildly thick, level two, moderately thick. Nope, I have that wrong. Slightly thick is number one, mildly thick and moderately thick is number three. So let's time that for 10 seconds and see where we end up. Okay, so we ended up in the two range and that's exactly where we wanted to be. So it passed. So I hope that gave you an idea of the advantages of the funnel and then also how to use both the funnel and the syringes. So now I turn it to John. Okay, everyone. Before we get going on the food, I just want to do one more thing. Supplements. Supplements are a big thing that everybody wants to know how to thicken. They're very difficult. They're full of solids. They have less moisture available. They thicken unpredictably, and it can vary a lot. So what I did is I grabbed two supplements from the same brand, and the only difference between them is their flavor. And about 10 minutes ago, eight minutes ago, I finished mixing them off camera, and we're going to run a flow test now. And then at the end of the show, we're going to come back, we're going to do it again, so we can see how much it's changed. And these are actually half dose compared to what we normally do. So uh, it's something that we normally will do a one pump stroke in four ounces of liquid. Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to do one pump stroke in eight ounces. So it's that half dose for you. And we're going to go ahead and run the flow test starting now. So this is, I don't know if you can see it, but it is solidly in that level two area. It's kind of what I would call about a six. 
and right there in the middle. So I'm gonna write that on the side here that the vanilla started out at six and we'll put these in the fridge and come back to them later. Next, we'll check the chocolate, see how that is. And I prepared these exactly the same. You might've heard me actually mixing these off camera while Lori was talking earlier, because I wanted to give you like the live shot as to how this goes. So you can see this one's probably flowing a little bit slower than the other one. So I think it's gonna come in a lot thicker. And this, and the only variable here is the, the difference in the flavors. So that's what gets really interesting about this. So this is really close to the line between level two and level three. So that's more like a seven and a half. And uh, so it's the same bottle of thickener. It's two different supplements. So you can see that it behaves differently. So what we've really found with supplements is that we need to test these individually and make sure that they are... Um, they are behaving as you expect. So one of the things we've done is we've spent literally hundreds, if not thousands of hours testing supplements over the last couple of years. We've developed a workbook. It's not really something that we can share with people because it just has so much information in it. But if you contact your Sympathetic sales rep, they'll be able to go into this workbook here that you can see on the screen. And hopefully the most common supplements are already done. Uh, they'll be able to print out for you the formulas on how to use Simply Thick to thicken those supplements to the right levels. And we keep evolving this. We keep testing more things. Our requirement always is that at least two people have run the test fully and agree on the formulation so that we have uh, the same results and that we can confidently recommend to you how to use those. So that's a great tool for you. Next, I want to talk to you about extremely thick liquids. Okay, throughout this presentation today, we are going to talk about simply thick or extremely thick stock. Why do we use stock? We only use stock because it's convenient. It's not just taking water, so it doesn't feel like you're diluting something. There's nothing magical about an extremely thick stock. You could use extremely thick water. You can use a thick barbecue sauce. It really depends on what you're cooking and what the taste of the person is. So like, I love barbecue sauce mixed in with my pulled pork. And so to me, it's almost like pulled pork is about barbecue sauce, little pork in it. My wife, on the other hand, likes a little bit of sauce on top of her pork. So if you're going to make a minced and moist for me, use that barbecue sauce, mix it in, use that. If you're going to make it for my wife, use extremely thick stock. Mix that in and put a little bit of barbecue sauce on top. These methods are meant to be flexible for you so that you can do what makes sense to you. So I have eight ounces of vegetable stock here. I'm, the recipe is basically one pump stroke per ounce. So I'm gonna put in eight strokes. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then all we really do is we shake it. And, and that's how we make extremely thick stock. And then it's ready to go. And you will see Lori and I using a lot of this during the show. And the reason is because extremely thick stock does multiple things for you that you need to have done. Um, when you make something and it's too dry, you add moisture to it without having loose liquids that are gonna run out. When you have something that is too, um, when there's extra moisture, when you, when you put in the extremely thick stock, it sops up that extra moisture. So it performs actually both functions it, and it helps lubricate things. And the other thing it does is when you're going from minced and moist to puree, you can run the puree or the food processor forever on a meat. It is not going to puree without liquid. And when you add that liquid to it, you add the extremely thick stock, it purees beautifully. So let's take a look here and I'll show you what I mean. I have some minced beef, but it's not really moist. You know, this is just brown beef I put in the food processor. It's, it would pass you know, the size test. It goes through the tines. It's nice and tender, but it's crumbly and it doesn't really stick together. And if you read the minced and moist uh, descriptions from Itsy, it needs to uh, stick together and hold its form. So we just add a little bit of extremely thick stock on top. How much? It, it's going to depend on how much you're thickening. There's no real science to it. It's about watching, paying attention, and relying on your test methods. In this case, I've just put in a little bit. And now you can see it's moist. It is not sticky, but it is moist. And so now you can form the balls that Itsy talks about. And now you have something that is minced and moist and it passed the test method. So that's why we use extremely thick stock. So that's a key concept. We will be going through this over and over again all throughout the presentation today. And now we're going to turn it back over to Lori and she's gonna to talk to us about mashed potatoes. Thanks, John. So 
I made some mashed potatoes just before the webinar. And as you may know, mashed potatoes sometimes get too sticky over time. So we're gonna test the mashed potatoes a few different times today and see if they pass and we'll do some testing on it. But I did wanna tell you that um, I want to thank Basic American Foods for, let me grab that, thank you. I wanna thank Basic American Foods for donating the potato pearls. And if you, any of you probably use those type of basic American foods potatoes. And I did wanna tell you that on their website, they've got a listing of all their products. And so this particular product that I have right now, the um, potato pearls Excel original, they actually pass, they, they claim they pass for all the levels, four, five, six, and seven. So what we're gonna do, if you recall, for pureed, we're gonna make sure that nothing drips through the fork. So I have to tilt it to show you, nothing is dripping through. And then we wanna take a spoon and we wanna see if it comes off the spoon easily. And if you, did you see that? It came off pretty easily. So our potatoes have passed right now. And like I said, I made these just before the webinar. So that would have been about 30 minutes ago. Okay, so we're gonna come back to the potatoes. So I'll lay those aside. And now it's time to talk about bread. So if you guys have worked with Etsy at all, you've probably um, know that bread is not allowed on any of the levels except for regular. And so that can cause some issues with your residents or your patients because they love their bread. So first, let's just talk about bread and why we don't want to give bread to our dysphagia patients. And I've got a piece of bread in my hand, and there's a little exercise you can do. We'll do it. I'll do it in just a second. If you have a piece of bread, you can do it with me. Um, but what, with bread, what you, well, if you go to the FAQs on the ITSY website, you're going to find some excellent FAQs. So I highly recommend that. But there are a, a few about bread, and one of them compares bread to peanuts. And we know we would never serve peanuts to somebody with dysphagia or a swallowing problem. So that is one of the reasons why there's no bread. But let's, let's do this. I'm going to do it with you. If you have a piece of bread, just take a little piece out of the middle. And when you put it in your mouth, you just use your saliva. Don't chew, just see, put it in your mouth, see what happens. Oh, um, we'll do that for a second. I think John's gonna do it too. Hi, John. <laughs> so Hi, I'm, not, I'm not gonna swallow this, I'm gonna I take it out. To the roof of my mouth. Yeah, so it sticks to the roof of your mouth, right? And mine got, was in a ball. That kind of looks like a peanut, doesn't it? So you can see that that is a choking hazard. So that's why we don't wanna serve bread to our dysphagia patients. So if you did, you, and now, so if you ever do this test, of course you can do it yourself, or you can do this little exercise with family members of your dysphagia patients. If they, if they say, my mother, you know, I want my mother to have bread. You can do this so, and show them what happens and why it would be dangerous. Okay, so next. We developed, during COVID, a lot of sales reps had a lot of time, and we developed a a pureed bread recipe. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to teach you how to do it. So the recipe, I'm going to pull them out. Um, the recipe is online. Thank you. The recipe is online. You can go to the Simply Thick website and you can get the recipe. And we have um, recipes for single batch and for three times and six times batch. So you can, you can get that. So what I want to do first is I'm gonna step through the recipe with you and we're gonna make it. So I put four pieces of bread in the food processor and I'm gonna process this down to breadcrumbs. If the longer you process it, it will be heavier, a heavier batter if that's what you want. And I'm just gonna check and look at it, make sure it looks like it's correct. And that is looking pretty good to me. So now I'm gonna add the ingredients that we need to add. So. It calls for three pumps of Simply Thick. So I'm gonna do that. And then it calls for three ounces of vegetable stock, one egg, and butter that, two tablespoons of butter that's either soft or melted. So we'll get that in there. And for those of you who want to know, there's about 150 calories in a slice. So it's, it's nice nutrition. So now we're going to 
process it. And we're going to take a look and we're going to make sure that everything is kind of got processed and we'll wipe the sides off. And then we'll put it in just a little bit longer. Okay. Now, the next step is we actually have these very cool bread forms. So I want to make sure that you, oh, that's okay. You can see that. And so I want to, I'll talk about this more later, but um, we also know people do eat with their eyes. So when they, when we use forms, people tend to eat more, but you can make a nice bread form. And these, we don't think these are available anywhere else. So you can purchase them on the Simply Thick website. So this recipe makes four slices. And, but what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna fill one to show you, and then we'll go from there. So I need to grab my, my scoop and my pan spray and spray that. And then I'm gonna take a scoopful of my batter. And I'm just gonna level it out in here to the best of my ability with this. I actually have a knife that we can do that with. But I think you get the idea that we'll, we'll fill up four of these. I'm not gonna spend time filling up four of them, but I filled up the one now. And what we do from here is we bake it or we steam it. So you can bake it in the oven at 350 for about 10 minutes, or you can put it in a steamer for about 10 minutes. And I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to put this aside, but I'm going to show you what I did do. So I made the entire batch and I've got four slices of bread here. And that's what it makes. This is cooked um, in the steamer. And so the steamer comes out quite moist. So if you wanted to reheat the spread, you could, but you need to be careful that it doesn't get too crusty on the sides. So I can actually pop one out and you can see here, we can do the testing. Why don't we do the testing and see what happens? So for puree, we wanna make sure it comes all right off the spoon and it did. And then we wanna grab a fork and make sure that there's no liquid, which you can probably tell there's not no liquids coming through. Also, I want to mention that the bread is level four for pureed, but you can serve it for any level. And that's the bread. Now I want to show you a slide and show you what you actually can do with bread. And this is very cool. So these are pureed sandwiches. The one on the left is ham on marble rye with egg salad. The one in the middle is chicken salad on wheat. And the one on the right is egg salad on honey wheat. So it's pretty yummy. You can do a lot more. You can serve bread in a very appealing manner to your residents or to your patients. And be sure to go to our Simply Thick website to grab the recipe and if you want the food forms. Okay, now it's John's up now. You do mashed potatoes? Oh, no, I got mashed potatoes again. That came quick, didn't it? So let's test the mashed potatoes and again. So... You want to do the spoon tilt test. You can see it came right off. And then we want to make sure that there's no thin liquid and there's not. So that continue to pass. Thank you. Okay, so I have prepared some frozen meatballs. I cooked them in the microwave so they're nice and juicy and ready to go. And we are going to process it first down to level six and then we'll do show you how to do level five and level four. So level six is pretty easy. Uh, I have this cutting board here that shows the dimensions of 15 by 15 milliliters, millimeters, sorry. And then over here, it does the, the four by four for the mince and moist. Maybe the resolution is not enough where you can see that. But when you see this up and close, it's very obvious how big parts, pieces need to be. So I can just simply slice them very quickly and I will have 15 mil, millimeter by 15 millimeter pieces and very easily make level six. Uh, because these are commercial meatballs, they break down really easy, they're quite soft, so it's not that big of a surprise that they're pretty easy to chop into soft and bite-sized pieces. As Lori mentioned, uh, generally people can eat down a level. Um, so if 
if you get to a solid meat like a chicken or a, a steak and it's just too tough and it's not soft enough when you do your test methods, like when you do the, the fork test, you know, you can see that deformed it perfectly. It cuts very easily from the side. If it doesn't pass that, you can do the minced and moist in that way. So now I'm going to take the rest of the meatballs and I'm going to put them in my food processor here. Hopefully I won't throw any off the edge of the table, but you never know with me. I'm always looking to cause trouble. So we put them in the food processor and then we are going to put the cover on. And you will see this is a very consistent process with which we do what we do all the time. We process it for 10 or 15 seconds, and then we have it so that we can open it up and we can check and see the particle size. I'm gonna give it just, I like to scrape down the sides in case anything got caught. I spin the blades a little bit, make sure nothing's caught under there. I can see a couple big pieces. So we're gonna just run it again for another 10, five or 10 seconds. So now we have stuff that is, let's just take a scoop out and I can show you down here. We have it, it's gonna pass through the tines of a fork. No problem. So the side is right. There's no moisture dripping under there. Now, because of these particular um, this particular meatball that I happen to buy, see, it's still a little crumbly. So I am going to add a little extremely thick stock because you know that's what I'm going to tell you to do. And then we're going to get that nice and moist and it's going to stick together a lot better. And then you're going to have something that's really going to be in the spirit of what it wants for minced and moist. Very easy to do. I'm just doing it here on the, on the cutting board rather than doing it in a bowl if you're doing a larger amount, but that's just to show you how easy it is. You put it together, comes out the spoon. There's nothing dripping under that. It's very simple and easy to do. So now what do we do to take this from minced to moist to puree? We're gonna close it, we're gonna turn this on. And like I said, I can run this for a very long time and it is not gonna turn into a puree. But as soon as I add our extremely thick stock, I hope I can hear a difference and maybe you'll see a difference on the side too is it suddenly begins to flow around and really process down. That's kind of the cool thing when you use some extremely thick stock. How much do I add? It's kind of, it's kind of by sight, it's kind of by sound. I think that might be a pretty good amount. We take it out and we take a look. Let's see how it's doing. See, it's a little sticky. So I'm gonna add a little more extremely thick stock. So. You don't really know how much you're going to add. And this is kind of the, the I don't know, the art of Itsy is, you know what you're looking for is an end goal. You know what your tools are. You know what you have to do, but you have to test. And again, it's, it's both the strength and kind of the, the frustrating part, right? Because we're not going to have recipes that work exactly the same. We deal with food. It is variable by nature. And you're not going to have the same meatballs that somebody else does. And so you just keep kind of, adding a little more extremely thick stocks. Now you can see it's coming off the spoon a lot better, but I think I'm gonna add just a little bit more because that just, that's how it's rolling today. And the end goal is something that really meets that idea of being a non-sticky puree. that's not gonna stick to the spoon. It's not gonna be too sticky. It's gonna fall off. There's no loose liquid. I think we're in pretty good shape now. I'm gonna guess, take that off. So when you go here, see that just comes off beautifully. Now there's still a coating there, that's okay. And so then you have your puree. We can put that down here. So we have our three levels all on one plate or one cutting board so you can see it. And then the fun thing that we can do, I gotta grab a glove for this, is that you can take these meatballs that you've made and you can actually form them into meatballs that you can serve people as meatballs, whether you put sauce on them or you're gonna put them on top of something else. But the fun thing is that you can take this and kind of form your own meatballs. Yeah, it's a little loose today. You get the idea that you can put them together and you can form shapes and they're gonna stay in place on the plate. Sometimes I use my hands, sometimes it's better to just spoon them off but they're more like a meatball than just your normal plop down food. 
So that's what we're going to do with meatballs. And I'm going to turn it over to Lori, and she's going to show you how to do the same thing with chicken. Okay, thanks, John. So it, you'll notice we're, it's, you're going to see things repeated, and you're going to see that it's pretty easy. It's the same process, and it's easy, and that's why we're repeating it. So you did learn about chicken a little while ago, but let's go a little deeper on how I actually made it. So I've got my cutting board, and I've got my knife, so I want to go for soft and bite size first. So I'm just going to take my chicken and I'm going to cut it into the 15 by 15 by 15 size. And you can see it fits right on there. And then we want to take our fork and make sure it mashes with the fork pressure test that mash nicely. And then we want to make sure we can cut through it. And that did. So that passed. Okay. So now I'm just going to throw this all into the food processor and we're going to make minced and moist first. So I think I explained to you that I had bought some chicken that's pre-cooked and this is how it comes. And I'm just going to put it in my food processor and I'm going to process it down to my four by four. Oh, see now if you can see that, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a big piece in there that wasn't processed. So you have to keep going and you have to check. So that's looking pretty good. So it's mixed, but as John talked about, it's not moist. So we'll take a little bit out and we'll put it in our bowl. And then we'll just add some extremely thick stock until we get it the thickness that the, the minced and moist. So we're adding our moisture. And like John said, this is an art and not a science. And I know for many of us that are healthcare professionals, that kind of bugs us, right? Because we always learn science, but it's an art. And that's where you have to, you know, just see, like I did not add enough. It's gonna depend on the amount of food you have in there. I don't have a lot of food in there, but that is looking pretty good to me. So let's do our testing and see what we think. It came right off the spoon. And then let's see if it drips through. It's not dripping through at all. So that would pass from instant moist. Okay. Now I've we go back to the food processor. Now we need to do puree. So as John was talking about, and for the chicken, same thing. We need to add our extremely thick stock. And it's well, it, it kind of like John said it, you can hear it kind of change. So we can look at it and see what we think. So I'm looking at that and I, I could already tell you it needs to be processed further. So and also another comment, you want to make sure you need, you have the right amount of food in the right size food processor. So we we'll want to look at that. That's looking pretty good to me. So let's just pull some out and see what we have here. So it's our puree. And we want to do the fork drip test. And you can see it's not dripping. And then let's see if it comes off the spoon. And it came off the spoon. So we have a good puree. So of course you wanna make sure there's no lumps and then you wanna make sure there's no separate liquid. And that's what we did with the testing. So that's, no, I got one more thing I have to show you. I always wanna forget this. So remember I showed you our food form before. So this is a nifty food form that you can get on our website, but it's pretty neat because it's got this little doodad at the top that helps you get it out. So let me just show you how to use it. Well. We'll spray it with our pan spray, and then we'll spoon some of our puree in here. And I thought I'd talk a little bit more about how people eat with their eyes. And there's, there's a study you may have seen that from Rush University. And I think it's a fascinating study because it they did a study and they found that people who got shapes ate about 500 calories more a day of pureed foods. When I say shapes, it could be something round, something square, something triangle, and people actually ate 500 more calories a day. So we're even making it look like something like chicken. So we'll just pop it out. And 
I'm not perfect at this, but there's our chicken, our chicken breast. So pretty cool. Now we have it. Okay, so John, it's your turn for the veggies. All right. How exciting. We always want our vegetables, right? So I'm going to start with carrots for you guys. And just like everything else, we're going to start with uh, chopping them up into level six. And that's very easy to do again because we have our cutting board. These are just cooked carrot discs, uh, microwave. These are just any old store brand. But again, it's very easy to make so you can bite sized. It's a simple process. And then you get them and then we can test them and we see that they mash pretty easily. They cut pretty easily. There's no loose liquid. Soft and bite sized, easy to do. So we put the rest in our processor bowl. Now, versus a meat, carrots are going to have a, a lot of moisture already in them. And so probably going to need less extremely thick stock than a meat. But the process is still the same. What we're going to do, we run that processor. We see that the stuff is minced. And again, it's dry. It's dry. That's what we see. So this time I'm just going to add my extremely thick stock to the top. Grab my other jar. And then I am just going to mix this a little bit. And you can see, because if I run the processor at this point, having to add, add it in that extremely thick stock, it would almost go down to puree very quickly. So I just want you to see you can mix it in there or in another bowl on a large amount. And then I'll put it down here on the plate and you can see nothing's dripping out. It will come off of a spoon very quickly and easily. And it's got the right particle size. In fact, it doesn't stick so much, I have a hard time getting it on the spoon, right? comes right off. So that extremely thick stock is adding lubriciousness to it so it doesn't stick together. So then to take it down to puree, we just turn it on. Sounds like we need a little more extremely thick stock. I can hear that sound change. When you do this yourself, you're gonna be amazed. I, I don't know that over Zoom, a lot of times Zoom has sound suppression. Can't hear the machines. But uh, here live and in the kitchen, I can hear Lori hits the puree. She can hear when I hit it. It's rather remarkable how consistent that is. And when it's floating around, it's maybe a little more. And again, what we're doing is we're trying to get all the particles ground down. We're trying to get it so it's very smooth, that there's not a lot of lumps. And so it's really kind of this iterative process, breaking it down, making sure nothing's stuck under the blades and then just processing it. And it's getting very smooth. So now we have our puree. Throw that down here next to everything else. And then you can see, you know, there's no liquid that drips out of here. It falls off the spoon very easily. This one has almost no residue because the carrots just come off so cleanly. So that's how you do the carrots. Now, keep talking about presentation. I have right here a uh, pastry bag all ready for us. And I'm going to take this carrot puree. And I'm just going to throw some in there. And I think oh. we still got that plate of chicken over here. Uh, take out my pastry bag. Take off my tip cover. I knew that was going to be the problem today. And then do this here, Liz. So now next to our chicken breast, we can have carrots. And it's very easy to do. Trust me, I am not an artist of any sort. So if John can do this, you can do it too. <laughs> And that's all there is to it. That's how you do carrots. But, you know, we don't want just one vegetable because we really like our vegetables. So we're going to do broccoli as well. And it's going to be almost exactly the same, right? I take out my broccoli bites. I'm going to cut them with my knife. Very easy to do. Get them down to the right size. 
and then test them. They smush, there's no moisture, they cut easily. And you know, it's broccoli. So if you needed to process it more, you would simply, um, you know, cook it a little more. So if it was, was too firm and you needed to soften it, just cook it more. That's how broccoli works. We throw the rest into our food processor and we are just going to chop it. Um, scrape down the sides a couple times. Now the broccoli seems to have more moisture. This one, I might not have to add any extremely thick stock. So one, one of the things, keep in mind here, this one, see, I don't have quite enough broccoli in here. It just throws it up on the sides right away. So this time I would have to keep scraping it down a lot to get it to process, which is something to keep in mind as you do this. Lori did mention you want to size your batch to the size bowl you have. So here, Minced and moist. This one, the particle sizes look good. I don't see anything dripping. And this one actually, you know, I don't see any real reason to add any extremely thick stock for the minced and moist. That's perfectly acceptable. That's what you're gonna find when you run into the variability. But I do know this is not gonna process down to puree because I could tell by the way it was processing. So we add our extremely thick stock and then we put the lid back on. We process it. The batch size is a little small, so it's going to take more scraping, and that's okay. Don't worry. You run into these problems; they happen. It's part of the natural variability. It's about learning and being confident in your skills that you're developing, and just knowing the tools you're using. I can see it's it's going now. There it goes. See how that started to flow, and we got it chopped down enough. Now it's just a matter of letting it run for a moment. I think it can be intimidating for people when you first start learning it, but really, as you as you learn the tools and begin to use it, you begin to get more confidence. You know, when you run into problems like you saw, just having problems getting the process a little bit. No big deal. Just keep scraping it down. Just keep trying. It's going to get there. Don't panic. It's it's really not that hard. So again, puree, nothing dripping, and this should come out the spoon pretty well. Well, if I started with the clean spoon, that would help. So you go with the spoon and then it comes off nicely. So that's how you make your pureed broccoli. I'm not gonna make you guys watch me uh, put this in a piping bag again, but you know, off camera before we started, I did put some in a piping bag so you can see my broccoli artistry as well. Again, remember, I am no artist. I'm a purebred engineer. Uh, you don't want me doing painting your house or anything like that, picking colors for you. But even I can make this stuff look pretty good. So that's how we handle our vegetables. And I'm going to turn it back to Lori. Okay. Hi again. So now we're back to our mashed potatoes. And I don't think I explained with the mashed potatoes. So it was just... Um, their mashed potato mix from basic American foods um, with hot water. So let's go back and look at mashed potatoes and see if it passed. So if it's still passing. So our spoon tilt, boy, that came right off. So that, that was good. And then it's not dripping through. So some potatoes, like I've, I've mixed some other potatoes like that I bought from the store and they got really sticky and they didn't come off the spoon. And so what you could do is you just have to have a plan for what do you do if the potatoes do get really sticky and they don't pass it seed? Do you, um, what, and so that's what you need to be thinking. So the, these potatoes are good and they passed. So that's, that's the mashed potatoes. So next I'm gonna talk about fruit. So we're gonna be going through a few different fruits today. And I thought we would start with applesauce because we, I'm sure you serve applesauce to your purees every day. Um, I'm guessing that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our applesauce and we're gonna thicken one. What we're gonna do is put this four ounce cup into a bowl. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to 
give it one squirt of Simply Thick. And I'm gonna mix that in. And I'm gonna put it on my plate that says thickened applesauce, which I, I'm not sure if I have to turn that or not. We'll do this for now. We'll just put that right on there. And then I'm gonna take another plate and I'm going to put my other, I'm not gonna thicken it and I'm just gonna put it on the plate. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna come back to this in just like a few minutes or a little later in the webinar. And we're gonna see, we're gonna compare them, okay? So that's all with the applesauce. So now we're gonna talk about bananas and I'm gonna turn it over to John. Okay, so one of the key concepts it's a, is that it is a descriptive diet. It is not a prescriptive diet. It's a very difficult concept to understand at first. And I had a hard time for a while. And then it was finally explained to me by one of my favorite things in the whole world, bananas. And the way that you can tell with um, or what prescriptive versus descriptive means is that ITSI gives us a set of descriptions, test methods, and techniques on how food is supposed to behave, how it is described. And we use the description of what soft and bite size is, what mince and moist is, what puree is, but they leave it to you to decide if something meets that description. In a prescriptive diet, they would tell you if it's on the menu or not. So my friend, the banana here, we all know the bananas come in different firmnesses, different colors, different degrees of uh, being ready to eat. And that's why this is the perfect one to give us an example because we just don't know, is today's bananas on the menu? And that's why ITSI gives us test methods. So when we open up a banana, then we can just cut a piece off and we can see, is this one soft enough? Is it gonna work for a soft and bite size today? And that's the whole key to ITSI. So this one, my thumbnail is white and yeah, it went through. When I cut here, it goes through. So that banana looks good. We take a look at the next one. And I'm gonna guess this one's gonna be okay too. Sometimes we get some really green ones on these webinars, and I bet you do too. When you get them in your facilities, you're going to have some that are really good and some that are not. And this one, I can tell before I've even opened it, it is going to match, or it's going to match and be just fine. So everybody knows and everybody can understand that what the banana means with that. So in a, in a prescriptive diet, they tell you what's on the menu or what's not. So sometimes bananas would be on the menu, sometimes it would not. That's just a fact of life. So you need to be able to test it and decide for yourself, does it meet the requirements today? Now, if you wanted to serve it soft and bite size, you're gonna have to cut the banana discs a little bit. If you wanted to serve bananas minced and moist, um, I am not gonna put this in my food processor because I think the food processor is just gonna, it's gonna puree it almost immediately. So in this case, what I do is I like to cut them into thin discs and then people who are better with their knife skills can come back and mince them very well. I'm not very good, so I like to use the banana or the fork to just kind of crush them. Um, I'm not trained as a chef, so I just don't do that very well. But you can get it kind of minced rather than being a pure mash like that. And because ITSI allows three dimensions, four by four by 15, I can do that pretty good just like this. Now, the problem here, if you're paying attention to ITSY descriptions, is this is gonna be a little sticky. And, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's okay. What I like to do, and I know this is gonna surprise you a lot, right? So I'm gonna add some extremely thick stock. And why do I do that? Because that just kind of coats each of the little pieces and then they don't stick together. And it makes a better minced and moist version. So you don't get that sticky banana feel to it, but it still eats just fine. So that's how I make my minced and moist bananas. And you can see it really just comes off the spoon much easier. And then if you, just to save on a little bit of time, we pureed off, off camera. And you can see that once you run a banana into, into a blender, it purees very quickly. And again, with some extremely thick stock, it becomes not very sticky. So that's how you process bananas. And that is also, why it's a, is a descriptive diet, not prescriptive. It always depends on the food, how you prepare it. You know, if you think about it, if you undercook some broccoli, if you undercook some green beans, they're not gonna process very well. So you have to cook it well, and you have to rely on your test methods to tell you that you did it right. Or the flip side is, like we mentioned before, if you cook some meat and it's too firm, 
process it down to the next level and serve it. That's fine. So it's always, you can't say, oh, chicken's on this level or chicken's on that level. It's always about how you process it and how it's testing today in your kitchen with um, the ingredients you have today. So now I'm going to turn it back to Lori and she's going to talk about, I think, peaches, right? Well, yeah. first I'm going to talk about watermelon and then oh, I'm going okay. to talk about peaches. I added this in. So I know it's the winter, but you still can buy watermelon in the grocery store. And um, so... I just wanted to give you some ideas for watermelon. So watermelon has obviously a lot of water, and so it wouldn't be allowed on an itsy diet. But what you can do is you could, you can take your watermelon that's seedless and put it in your food processor or your blender and blend it to a liquid. And once you do that, you can thicken it. So you can provide a tasty watermelon drink for people who want a refreshing, something refreshing with watermelon. The other thing you can do is you can take that drink thickened and then you can freeze it into popsicles. So this is a watermelon popsicle and it's very tasty and it would, since this is mildly thick, it would be mildly thick when they swallow, it would be mildly thick because it was thickened ahead of time. So that recipe is on our website at simplythick.com. So I wanna make sure you saw that. And okay, so next we're gonna talk about peaches. But first, I'm gonna use a little bit different food processor for this. So I'm sure many of you work with people that go home. That's why the cookbook is gonna be great. But we also discovered a, a, a different kind of food processor that I think is really good for small batches or for people at home. So this is what it looks like. So this is called a Ninja, a ninja Chop. There we go. And I like it because it's powerful and you can buy it at Walmart for 20 bucks. So it's, um, it's, it's a good one. So what I thought we would do is we'll make some peaches in there, but let's talk about peaches first. So I know that many places use these small cup peaches. Oh, right here, there we go. And we can, these are actually the right size for soft and bite-sized, but you would just have to drain it well, and then it would, this would be compliant for soft and bite-sized. Um, the one I have in here, and I'm just gonna use my hands, some of these pieces might be a little big, so you just need to cut them to get them into fitting into the correct size, the 15 by 15 by 15. Um, to make minced and moist peaches without a lot of success. So I'm going to do pureed peaches, and then your minced and moist can easily eat the pureed, and they're really very tasty. So let me show you how to use this food processor and how to do the peaches. So I took a can of peaches. I just took some peach chunks, Del Monte peach chunks, and um, in the can, and it's a 15 0.25 ounce can, and I put it in here, and but I drained it well first. That's the key is you want to drain it. Then I'm going to add, so I made some extremely thick apple juice to put in here because it seems like it'd be kind of weird to have extremely thick stock made with vegetable broth into, um, into your, your peaches. So I'm just going to put a little bit in and we'll see how it works out. Okay. So what do you want me to do? I was trying to move it on the camera. Oh, oh, thank you. Okay. You've got me. Okay. So look how cool this thing is. It's really powerful. So I'm just going to push the top. Love Cuisinarts, but the small Cuisinart is not as powerful as this. So let's look at it. So first I need to just check it out and make sure that there's no pieces. And I see some, some pieces, so I need to give it another go. And then we can text it. You don't know how much I like this little guy. It's so powerful that it's amazing. <laughs> Okay, so let's try it. Let's see what we got. So let's do the spoon tilt. That came off very well. And then let's grab a fork and let's see if it drips through. So it's not dripping through. I don't know if you can see there's a little tail 
a tail is okay, but it's not dripping through, so that passed. So I didn't add a whole lot of extremely thick apple juice, I want to say stock, but um, I added enough to kind of bind it up. And this is very tasty. And I think that even your minced and moist will like the puree on this because it's just very, very tasty. Okay, but that's, just, let me move that. And then we'll, we will go to our next thing, which is we're gonna look at our applesauce now. Oh, you're gonna find this very interesting. So we have this, this right here is your thickened applesauce with the Simply Thick. This right here is your applesauce regular with no Simply Thick added. I don't even need to really say anything to, it's a visual. So the thickened applesauce is very nice and it's held together. And without the Simply Thick, it's just, it's it's got, liquid separate from the solid, which we know is not allowed on um, on our dysphagia diets because it's it's dangerous for having mixed consistencies. So that that's the applesauce. Okay. So next, Next, you're gonna see an ice cream video. And I actually made ice thickened ice cream and the volume is not real high. So you might wanna turn your volume up so you can hear it. And if you have any issues with it, you can let us know later and we can make sure you can hear it. Next, I'm gonna show you how to make thickened ice cream. So first thing is we have a recipe that you can get from your Simply Thick sales rep, or you can get it online at simplythick.com and it's thickened ice cream. So what you need is you need four cups of ice cream and you're gonna need simply thick to thicken it. And we're gonna use um, the bulk packet mild pre thick today. And so what you do to make ice cream is you soften the ice cream for 15 minutes. So that's what I get here, I've got chocolate ice cream. I've got four cups of chocolate ice cream that I've softened for 15 minutes. Then I'm gonna add this to the food processing bowl. And then I am going to add my Simply Thick. Very easy to do. And I'm going to add my Simply Thick directly into the bowl. And let's do that. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to blend it in the food processor until it's, until it's blended. And Simply Thick actually blends it very easily. So and now we can cut it and see that it is blended very well. And it looks like it's very smooth and blended. And what we're going to need to do is refreeze it, and then it'll be ready to sleep. Okay. So you you learn how to make thickened ice cream. It's very easy. You can do it with any flavor. And I don't know if I mentioned this on the video, but even ones that have chunks, if you have a good food processor. And so what I've got here is I've got. I, I, I took this out before the webinar, the ice cream. And so we'll see if it passes. The, the freezer here in our new kitchen is very, very strong. And so I felt like I had to take it out earlier. It was really solid. So let's do the testing for it. So we wanna make sure it comes off the spoon and that came off the spoon nicely. So it's not too sticky. And then we need to make sure it's not gonna drip through. So it's got a tail but it's not dripping through. So um, you got it. And this is really, really yummy. So um, I hope that you'll consider it for your, your residents, or your patients. I think they'd like it because, you know, we don't allow ice cream because it's regular ice cream because it's thin liquid. Okay, next I'll turn it to John. All right. So uh, the final thing we're gonna talk about today in, in the food area is pasta. Now, pasta is very, very difficult when it comes to the itsy diet because pasta is basically just starch. And when you just have starch, 
and it's hot and it's cooked and it cools down, it's just going to stick together. I mean, starch, when you convert it and you release it from the pasta, it becomes very sticky. We searched, we scratched our heads and, and we were basically ready to give up. And then we finally went back to the drawing board and we just tried some crazy things. And here's what we came up with. And we think it's very doable. We think it's very possible. It's a very different process though. So we take our pasta noodles and we cook it in at least two, if not three times as much water, three times as long. So what I mean is instead of putting however many ounces in four quarts of water, we put in half as much. The idea is that as the water is boiling, you're removing more of that starch. I mean, you know, at Italian restaurants, they always talk about how good that is at the end of the day, the, the boiled water with the pasta that's been boiling in there all day. That's because the starch is coming out, the flavor is coming out. So we're using extra water to rinse out more of that starch. Then when we get done cooking it, we cook it for 30 minutes instead of 10 minutes. We want to just really cook it and get as much out. Then we put it in the strainer, we drain it, we wash it in cold water because we want to wash away any of that loose starch that's there. Then we put it in a bowl overnight, and this was full of water until five minutes ago. I just drained it out. And to cool it down and to remove any loose starch that's there. And the whole idea is to cook out as much as we can and then process it while it's cold not while it's hot, because if you process it hot and you release all that starch, it's just going to stick together. And so, and because you have loose starch, we're not even going to use extremely thick liquids. We're just going to use milk. So to process it, it's very easy. We just put it in our bowl and then we do just like anything else. Uh oh, got it stuck. There we go. Now, this is going to take a number of times to just get it to chop down. You, I'm kind of surprised. It almost takes more energy to chop down cold pasta than it does beef or chicken. And I don't quite know why that is, but I just know that that's been my experience. So, this time I'm going to add some milk as it's processing. Talk about a couple ounces, two to four ounces, depending on how much pasta you have. I think, yeah, my blade, my blade was up. That's why I wasn't processing well. So because we process this while it's cold, it's still kind of thick, I'm gonna add a little more milk. But we're trying to process it in a way so that any starch that's there is not gonna get too thick and too sticky. And then the idea here is rather than keeping it hot is we are going to put it somewhere where We can warm it up when we're ready to serve it. It's kind of weird. I've never had a blade pop up on me like that over and over again. That's how you know this is live, right? Never know what's going to happen. So now we have this. See, I think that's still just a little bit too sticky. So I would add more milk. And it's really this iterative process. And that's what we do with all this stuff. We know what we're looking for in terms of physical characteristics because we have this descriptive diet and we're just processing things in a manner to get it to where we need it to be using the tools in our hands. In this case, it's milk, the food processor. I'm gonna run another test, see how sticky it is. See, now I can tell it's getting better. So maybe one more time with a little more milk and then we'll be ready to, to go. So these are the things that happen. You know, you just, like I said last time, it's, it's about processing, processing, knowing what you're working with, working with your tools, even if the blade wants to come up. And then we can test it. And you can see that's coming out quite nicely now. It's not as sticky. So then 
Um, oops, we want to turn that on. Let's talk about Maranatha sauce. This is just like our applesauce. We have regular marinara sauce. There's a couple of issues with regular marinara sauce. Actually, there's chunky tomatoes in here and it separates into a, a loose liquid. So I thickened this. I put these on the plate right at the beginning of the webinar. So they've been sitting out for you know, an hour, hour and 15 minutes now. And that just shows you the difference. And what I wanna show you is how we put all of this stuff together. In the end, uh, I have some pasta that I, th I thickened before uh, coming on screen. So you can put that in your bag. And when you pipe it out, it's gonna look a little bit like spaghetti because it's got that thick structure to it. It doesn't take very long. You do that. And then if you remember at the beginning, the webinar, we made some meatballs, right? So we can take off our meatballs. Can drop them on here. And then you take your thickened marinara sauce, need a spoon. Right here. And then you drizzle that on top. You'd be surprised, even my 16 year old son, when I made this and heated it up, he said, You know, that's not bad, Dad. And then, of course, we still have our carrots. So you can have some carrots. And everybody likes broccoli, right? So there you go. There's a gourmet meal, it's level four style. So I think uh, instead of saving all the questions till the end, we're going to stop right now. We're going to do a little Q&A session because we've just talked about food. Before we go on to liquids, we make sure we get to your questions about food. So I'm going to ask Liz to come back on and uh, moderate the questions for us. All right, folks, at this time, we do have several questions, so we'll go ahead and dive on in and get some of those food questions out of the way so that we can really focus on liquids. And then, of course, we'll have more time at the end as well. So let's get started. All right, question from Bethany. Does the fruit taste like stock flavor? Now, Lori, you addressed this a little bit, but can you remind us again, what thicken liquid did you use when you want it to thick thicken the um, peaches or any other fruit? So thanks, Liz. So I didn't use the thickened vegetable stock because that just doesn't seem like it would taste very good, does it? So I used thickened apple juice, but you could really use um, thickened whatever juice that you wanted to do, you could use in there and I'm sure it would be very tasty. Really affect the flavor that much. Um, I wouldn't use a, an animal stock, like a beef or chicken, just because that seems too strong. But I think if you use vegetable stock, you're just not going to affect the flavor that much. I agree. I like going with that apple juice and the other juices. And Lori, another question for you, speaking of fruits, how much was the Ninja Chop? How much did it cost? Oh, one moment, please. Let me get your mic on. Right. So the Ninja Chop was about $19.99 at Walmart. It was more expensive on Amazon. Um, if I remember correctly, it was about $30, but it's a pretty good deal if you're looking for a, a small food processor. I thought it was a great deal. Excellent. Thank you. And let's go ahead and see what else we have going on here. Hmm. Oh, uh, John, let's turn to you for a moment. Speaking of pastas, since that's fresh in our head, how did you make the mac and cheese level six that you mentioned? Mac and cheese level six. Uh, well, generally you would cook the, the shells. That, that's usually what we recommend the shells. And then um, you just cut them down to size, down to the level six size, and then you can blend in the cheese sauce. I don't remember the recipe off the top of my head. I know that we have one. Uh, couple different ways of doing it, whether you make the, whether you use like the craft shells and cheese and you use their magic cheese sauce, or whether you make your own, whether you're using Velveeta or something like that. Uh, but we do have those recipes available. 
Thank you for that. And then here's a question that I think would be a great clarification, John. The question is, so if you want minced and moist pasta, do you not just process it as long as pureed? So perhaps this person is new to Itsy, but let me ask that again. If you want minced and moist pasta, do you not just process it as long as pureed? Uh, what you would do for minced and moist is you probably would process it less. It gets down to that particle size sooner. And then if it's still a little bit too sticky, you would just blend milk into it to help dilute that starch. Um, I did skip that just in the, the interest of time, but you're going to process it less. About the time when I added the milk is about when you would have stopped. Um, but you can see when it gets down under that 15 millimeter length. And actually minced and moist with a spaghetti noodle, you could have you know large, you have almost one inch long pieces. Um, so you could have something a lot more like that. That makes sense. And then moving right along, here's a great question from Aaron. And John, I'll turn this to you first. What if your patients do not have a food processor, but they do have a blender? Okay. So the tactics are going to be the same. The batches are going to be smaller and you are going to, uh, it's just going to take more time of mixing and then scraping, mixing and scraping, mixing and scraping. Uh, blenders work. They're just not as efficient. And food processors, I would really encourage them to get their hands on one if they can, uh, because they just they process it so much better, so much quickly, so much quicker. Even if they can afford the the small one, the Ninja Chop. Oh yeah, that one. You know, it's under twenty. It's twenty bucks. So that could be an option for them potentially. Those are good product recommendations. Thank you. And Lori, we have quite a few questions regarding the bread. So I'll turn it to you. Can we freeze the bread? Yeah. Yes. My understanding is you can freeze the bread. You just want to test it when, after you've heated it and to make sure that it passes the, the testing. Got it. And then speaking of bread still, can the pureed bread be used for French toast? Yes, it can. Um, I think we have a, John, do we have a recipe for that in our cookbook? We may. I believe we do. I it, believe we do, but it's all the same kind of theory. I think start with French, yeah. with, with French toast and, and you process it. Yeah. So it's still like the same theory with, um, with the egg and the simply thick, the stock and the butter. I believe. So we can look that up and John's trying to look it up in the cookbook right now. Um, yeah, I keep going with questions. I'll let you know if I find the answer. Okay. All right. We'll move right along. We do have tons of questions. So thank you guys so much for all of these great questions. Um, let's see. I'm trying to bundle them for us here. Um, Lori, I will turn this to you since John is checking out the possible French toast recipe. This question comes from Jean. Do you have any advice on cottage cheese for level five and six preparation? Okay. Okay. So with cottage cheese, we had a guest speaker on before that, what level? I'm sorry, what level? For five and six. So um, we had a guest speaker who was a speech therapist who tested cottage cheese and and she was able to get a certain curd of cottage cheese and it did pass as i recall for level five and six so that's something you'll have to look at and you'll have to test but you know i've also heard other people say they couldn't get it to pass but she made it she got it to pass so did you have anything to add to that john um, i think that the food press would work fine with it and if it was too sticky, I would add some extremely thick stock. Okay. Uh, there was not a French toast recipe, but if I if I were to venture a guess, I would say make your French toast and then start from there. Make French toast, cool it off because hot French toast is going to be sticky. So make it the day before, put it in the fridge or something like that, and then process it just like Lori did. Yeah. And then you can microwave to heat it up. That's how I would do it. Steaming it. Yeah. All right. And sorry, I did switch to my mic for a moment. So if you didn't catch that at the end, you could seem it to heat it up. And perhaps we'll put uh, French toast in the second edition of the cookbook. Who knows? Now, speaking of extremely thick stock, we have some questions. I think one of these may have come in um, prior to us talking about extremely thick stock. 
further on, but let me ask it just in case. Uh, can you go through what exactly is the extremely thick stock? How did that idea come about? Uh, just briefly. Hold on one moment. You're faster than I am. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so extremely thick stock is, it's any type of stock. It could be vegetable stock, could be beef stock, fish stock, you have around. Uh, the reason we decided to go with stock is because it felt like a little better than just using water, using extremely thick water as something that would just feel like you're just diluting the food. So you're adding a little bit of flavor, a little bit of nutrition. You're not diluting it as much. That's why we picked stock, whether it's vegetable, chicken, beef, or whatever. Uh, most of the time I'm working with vegetable stock around here. Great. Thank you for that. And speaking of extremely thick stock, Holly asks, does using the extremely thick stock sometimes make foods too thick or sticky? Would moderately thick stock be more appropriate in some cases? I'm not aware of it making it too sticky. Um, and because the extremely thick stock is used for a couple reasons, one is, is that it provides lubrication and it allows it to process down. And the other one is that it absorbs loose moisture. It, it's kind of the sweet spot of those two. I bet you could get away with moderately thick uh, if you wanted to. Uh, you could play with it. It's just you've never tried it. Understood. And John, we do have additional pasta questions. For the pasta, can you address if reheating after puree, if that would change the stickiness or texture? And would folks likely not eat the pasta cold? So assuming you're reheating, what does that do to the integrity of the food? Uh, our recipe is designed to be reheated and that's how I've served it. Um, when I've eaten it, it seemed to hold together just fine. It didn't get, I think if you heated it up and then it cooled off over time, it's gonna get sticky again because pasta is going to release a lot of that starch. And so it is something to keep your eye on. Uh, but because we put in the milk and because we tried to boil out as much starch as we can, it doesn't get quite as sticky. But I, th I think it's the least bad option. I, there just isn't really good options for pasta. Um, we're happy with this. It's probably not perfect and it's not going to work in every situation. But I, I'm not aware of any other way to address this. And John, when you add milk to the pasta to d decrease the stickiness, is there a risk of adding too much milk so that the level four puree no longer holds its shape? There's always that possibility. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I don't think you're going to get there uh, when you're just adding a, a dib and a dab here and there. It's not going to be too bad. Um, there really is a lot of starch in the pasta. And I don't know. I'd have to add a lot more than I did. Uh, it, I think in, I don't remember the exact proportion, but it's sort of like a half ounce per couple ounces of pasta. So it's not a lot, but it is also sort of what you're pay, paying attention to. You don't get that stickiness, so you don't get the form to hold as well. But if you go too far, then it's just going to run. And John, another pasta question, and then we'll probably move on in a moment. Have you found a way to prepare a pureed rice that passes itsy testing methods? Not yet. <laughs> That's one of the next things we're working on and the next challenges. Uh, that and oatmeal, those are things that we just haven't solved. But if you find an answer, let us know. Yes, we're always open for advice and more exploration and other research. So if you do do testing on your own and find something uh, that's new and special, or perhaps that varies from what you see us doing here, let us know. Email us at itsy at simplythick.com because we are continually researching. So with that said, we are going to move on to working with some liquids here. Continue sending in your questions. We are going to save the last 10 to 15 minutes minimum for our remainder of our Q&A. So feel free to keep sending in those food questions and then of course continue submitting questions as you see us, see us thicken these liquids. So with that said, I am going to turn it back to John. Okay, so I thought we would talk a little bit about some of the stuff that probably you're gonna have in your commissary or have available. And just to emphasize again, that he gives us test methods to make our own determination. So I have a couple different puddings here. This one is a chunky pudding, and this one is a smooth one. And then I have a pudding as well. 
And so we're going to take a look at these. And, you know, first of all, a chunky pudding, you know, that comes off pretty nicely off the spoon. There we go. Um, so it comes off the spoon, no problem. Problem is the chunks. So it's kind of a mixed consistency. So that's going to be a problem. Uh, you can puree it, blend it down, and make it smooth. That would work. Um, here's another pudding. You just do a test and see it has a film on there, but I can see through it. So I would say that's fine. And so when you test these things in your facility, it's about checking and making sure that your everyday items are compliant. So this pudding. Again, I got the same result. It just comes off my spoon, no problem. It doesn't leave a very thick coating at all. So the point here is that you should be going through as you're going through an implementation and testing all the things you have and be aware that as you do this type of testing that and vendors are gonna change products on you, that you should be careful and when new things come in, reevaluate them. So now we're just gonna kind of do a rapid fire series of thickening liquids to different levels, just to show you how easy this is. And um, I didn't mention it in my fun bio that one of the things I do on the side is I, I have a TikTok channel where I do this all the time. I'm just mixing things left and right, up and down, and doing these demos so that people can see how easy it is. This is milk. We're gonna make it moderately thick. So we just put in two pump strokes with the four ounces, and we just mix. And one of the reasons I like to do these type of demos is so that people can see that it can be done in a minute or two or less. And you don't have this long waiting period, things like that. Something like milk is gonna be a little difficult. It's gonna take a little longer to mix. And the reason it's gonna take a little bit longer is because of the solids and things like, and the milk fat, it just kind of slows things down. But I'm not mixing vigorously. I'm not going crazy. I'm just kind of mixing, having a conversation with you about what we did this weekend. It's not that big of a deal and it's easy to do. And then, and I don't know, 45 seconds or a minute. And then Itzy gives us the tools to test. So we just grab our flow tester and we go ahead, pour it in here. And one of the things you'll find if you become proficient in Itzy is you can see almost right away. I can tell by the slow flow that this is gonna be moderately thick, no problem. And so when I'm done testing, can hold that up and you can see that it's up there at about nine. So a very easy, quick test. And that's how you do milk. Uh, let's talk about soda. Soda is something everybody likes. One of the things we did do at Simply Thick is we spent some time, we actually ran a design of experiments to come up with this one. Uh, all of our, we asked all of our salespeople to give us an idea of all the crazy ways that they had for making thickened soda. Just for fun, let's go with um, extremely thick. So I'm going to put four pump strokes in here and that's one container and we use a second container. So one of the things in the soda industry is that they make stuff that has a lot of foam. So it stays foamy for a long time, but that doesn't help us in our dysphagia world because if you stabilize that foam, especially with the thickener, you are going to get something that is just a foam forever. So I put it in there. I put it in my mixing container. And now I'm going to do kind of our magic trick is I'm going to release some of that foam. I'm going to mix for about five seconds. Yes, I am letting some of the carbonation out, but I want to do that because I don't want to make a huge foam in the end. So I take this and I pour it very slowly from one container to the next. And the reason we're doing this is we don't want to generate the bubbles now. Um, we actually had a we had a poster at Asha showing how to do this technique because it's pretty cool that it works. And when you compare it to all the other methods we did, and our endpoint was low foam. So now I mix like really slow, like half as fast as I was before. And because I'm going extremely thick, I'm even going to do figure eight. Sometimes it's hard on webinars. I get kind of carried away talking and distracted uh -oh. by what's going on. So I over mix sometimes. Um, you are not going to be able to run soda through a, an itsy funnel, no matter what level you do, because the bubbles are just going to change the flow characteristics. So we thicken our soda, and, and I don't know if you can really tell, but I can tell here it's nice and thick already. And doing the figure eight to make sure it just gets worked in there really well. You can see it is nice on the spoon. 
We'll see how it does on the fork. We might have to mix a little more. No, oh, it's mounting up on the fork. It's got slow drip. It's not continuously dolloping through. So there you go, level four soda. Um, one of the things we have here, what thickness did you make these? A mild. Mildly thick. So you can take ice cubes or you can take water that's thickened. We didn't take them out of the freezer soon enough that yeah. they're gonna pop out. But you can um, freeze your water. It'll make an ice cube. And then when you come back and you thaw them or you put them in a drink or something like that, they will melt into the right consistency. So you can have an ice cold beverage with a mildly thick ice cube or moderately thick or extremely thick. It all works very well. Um, let's go ahead and talk about something fun. A lot of times I heard people say that you cannot thicken Miralax and polyethylene glycol supplements. Uh, you can when you use a xanthan gum based thickener. There were a couple of case reports of problems with this or with the destruction of the viscosity with um, starches that you that it caused aspiration events uh, because when it lost its thickness level, uh, people serving it didn't know it was supposed to be thick. So we put in the Miralax and then that dissolves no problem. If you've ever done this with starch, it immediately loses its viscosity if it was thickened or you can't thicken it. We'll just do mildly thick here. So one pump stroke in the four ounces, and then we just mix. And this will thicken nicely for us, quick and easy without any problems. Takes about 30, 45 seconds, no big deal. So let's test it, see if we're mildly thick. Might not be. Might have to mix a little more. We'll see. Nope. It's, a, it's almost there. So we just have to mix it a little more. So that's the fun of live, right? You just keep mixing in any test. You have your test methods. You rely on your test methods when you're doing ITSI. And that way you're always confident that what you're serving is exactly what's supposed to be served. And test methods are great for that. And there's no more guessing. We used to get all kinds of calls before ITSI about the thickness of our product. Was it the right thickness? Was it the wrong thickness? I think this, I think that. We don't get those calls anymore. And if we do, the first question we ask is, well, what test method are you running? And there you can see now we're in level two, right in the middle. So the problem there was I tried to cut short the mixing time and it wasn't ready. So for one last fun thing, so I think we're running. Oh no, we yeah, got plenty got, of time. You got lots of time. How about some vodka? Anybody need some vodka? It's been a long afternoon for me. Um, Lori might need some. Uh, I'm sure the production team does too. Uh, these videos always get a lot of views on TikTok when I decide to thicken vodka or whiskey or something like that. Uh, again, it, it's just very simple to do. Why would you want to thicken something like this? We're going to give it two strokes. So we can do moderately thick. Or you know what? Oh, no, you don't do Pepsi with vodka. <laughs> um, you would want to thicken this because it might be something that somebody drinks, something that they have always drank, something that they enjoy once a week or, you know, uh, part of this is getting them to be, stay hydrated, right? So this will thicken whatever you want, coffee, tea, beer, milk, wine, soda. We like to just demonstrate all those different things and how easy it is in just a few minutes to make a bunch of beverages, test them, make sure they're the right consistency and demonstrate the flexibility of things that are going on. So how about this? You know, you've got some nice thick vodka. Uh, if you had some moderately thick ice cubes, you could pour it over that. Then you got vodka on the rocks. If you had some moderately thick orange juice, you can make a moderately thick screwdriver. Got all kinds of possibilities here. But you can see it's just dripping. I messed up my timer. <laughs> and so that's about 10 seconds. But yeah, it's a level three. No problem. Um, so now you got nice thick shots, right? Um, 
Let's go back and test these from the beginning. We had an off-camera accident. I don't know if you guys saw it, but uh, <laughs> we, we had the vanilla spilled all over the place. Um, Hopefully I saved enough. <laughs> our, our cleaning bill is going to be pretty nice this year or after this. Yeah, we're um, really wet. <laughs> so we're going to test this vanilla supplement that's been sitting in the fridge for an hour and a half now. See how much it's changed. And interestingly, it feels like it seems like it got a little thinner. Did it stay, stay the same? So we got it at about a seven in the middle of the mildly thick, and it was at six to before. So it hasn't changed very much. So that's pretty stable. That was a good result. And then the chocolate, we want to check that one as well. This, you remember this one was on the border between mildly and moderately thick before. And now when we run it, I think this is going to be moderately thick. So you got two supplements, the exact same manufacturer, the exact same preparation technique by the same person. And after they've been sitting around for a little while, one of them is mildly thick and one of them is moderately thick. That is the challenge we face with supplements. So for the chocolate, we would have a little different recipe than we do for the vanilla. And that's what you find as you go through this. Um, all right. We got another carbonated beverage here. We got Red Bull. So again, we put our pump stroke over here. This is going to be, we're going to go six ounces this time. And we're going to go slightly thick. We've hardly talked about slightly thick today. Slightly thick is that new thickness level that came into being with ITSY. It is something that I expect in the next few years that people are going to use more and more and more. I've had people in England tell me that it is the number one thickness they do. You see, I'm doing exactly the same thing I did with soda. Two cups. I mix this to get rid of some carbonation. Release some of that. And then we're going to pour slowly from one cup to the next. Um, slightly thick is something that is new to all of us. Uh, our recipe for slightly thick is to put six ounces rather than four ounces. Um, we found that's much more reliable at producing slightly thick than simply going into eight ounces or something like that. And so our recommendation is six ounces. We do have slightly thick packets made already. So it's four grams in them instead of six. And then the idea is that you have something that will produce that um, slightly thick consistency with a packet. Works very nicely just to add a little bit of body to your liquids. I actually like to, to use them with my uh, almond milk when I make lattes at home to make it just a little bit thicker and stay together. So see, it comes packaged in the four gram packet. But when you have the pump bottle, it's one stroke for six ounces. And so, you know, it's not the most reliable, but just for kicks, let's run it here and just see what happens. Usually we say, it's not going to work well, but you can see it gets that head of foam on top. That's why I don't recommend the test. So I tried to add a little bit more so that the foamy head is on top. So you actually have four mil or 10 milliliters of liquid there. And then you can see that it's in the middle of level one. So you have a slightly thick Red Bull if you need more energy. Um, it's quarter two. Do we want to go to Q&A now? Okay, we're going to go to Q&A, and we're not going to thicken the beer. So that's okay. I'm going to wash my hand. All right. I'm sorry we didn't have time to thicken the beer. Um, we do have a video on that, I believe, though. We have some Guinness videos coming up for St. Patty's Day, so stay tuned. And speaking of our videos and social media, John, can you remind everyone, what is your TikTok handle? Uh, it is Simply Thick John. And uh, there's 5,000 crazy people out there who are subscribers. And I try to post content every day. I'm as dumbfounded as you are that there's 5,000 people out there that want to follow me making mixing demos and talking about Itsy stuff. But that's all I do. And we love it. You do have quite a few fans. And it's very helpful. It's a great resource, especially for people at home. You know, when you come home and suddenly you have to thicken things yourself. So I do highly recommend that. All right, we have many questions to get to. So I'm going to do my best to batch these questions into categories somewhat so that we stay on one topic. 
Um, so let's go ahead and see. There are folks asking about alcohol. So we did mention vodka. We mentioned beer can be thickened. John, are those the only alcohols that can be thickened or are there more? I, I honestly haven't run into one that it hasn't worked so far. Um, I'm thinking like Bacardi 151 might not work or ever clear. They're just too high. And the way you'll know that is that the xanthan gum will precipitate out. So you'll have a nice stringy white stuff. <laughs> but um, no, I haven't found any. And um, I think last week I, I put out some Irish whiskey or Scotch whiskey, a video of thickening some Cuddy Sark. So I just go to the store and buy whatever and come back here and thicken it. Wine works really well. I was just going to say, wine is beautiful. All right. And then, John, you touched upon this, but can you remind us, is ice in a beverage considered a mixed consistency? Uh, generally speaking, I have not run into people who think it is because mm -hmm. the ice cubes are so big that they're not meant to be swallowed together. But if somebody's going to chew the ice cubes, I could see that argument. Um, we've just seen people who enjoy it on ice and when it's large and they're not chewing on it or trying to swallow those pieces, it hasn't been a problem, but it is a fair point. It's something that you have to evaluate on a patient by patient mm -hmm. basis. And, uh, if you're concerned about the patient putting the whole thing in their mouth, it could be a concern. Thank you. And Lori, we're going to turn it to you because we haven't uh, heard from you in a while. This is a great question. I think we uh, semi answered this during the presentation, but we may not have been clear because we are so in the woods about it. So let's go ahead and clarify for everyone. Lori, do you order the Simply Thick broth? So, okay. So I'm thinking you're talking about the extremely thick stock. So no, you can make it. So what you need for it is you need your stock. John was saying we use vegetable stock and you would add a pump of Simply Thick for every ounce of your broth. And then we just put them, yep, there you go. There's the stock. And then we just add for every ounce of stock, we add one pump of Simply Thick. And then we put them in our squirt bottles. We even have these little stickers that say extremely thick broth, level four. So it's that easy. And speaking of Simply Thick pumps, we did use a lot of our pumps today. We do have a question about those. Are the pumps for the thickener available for purchase for facilities? So are we talking about the small pumps? So we are using smaller 500 milliliter pump bottles just for ease today rather than our larger bottles, which I think John's going to try to find one. Um, but these you can buy on Amazon, the smaller bottles, the Amazon. Now John's coming up with our, our bottle that we sell in food service and we also sell other places. So that's our larger bottle. It, it's the same pump, just different length of the stem down here. Each one delivers six grams per pump stroke. They're used the exact same way. This one just has a smaller amount. And Let's go back to the foods for a little bit. Um, John and Lori, you can bo both speak to this. So John, I'll turn it to you first. And then Lori, if you have commentary, feel free to chime on in. Becky says, is it safe to pour gravy on top of the protein for levels four, five, six, or should it be served without gravy on top? Gen generally speaking, de depending on the particular patient, uh, I see a lot of times where it is served that way. It can be incorporated into the food. It because it, okay. My assumption when I'm answering this is that the, the gravy you're serving is a level four liquid by itself. So eat, when it's combined together in a bite, it's not that separate liquid, that separate thin liquid. Generally speaking, when we're talking about mixed consistencies. The concern is a thin liquid separating from a a thick liquid, or from the food and being tough to control. In this case, because you have something that's level four, it should be controlled with the bolus and not being separated. Yep. That's not to say that in all cases that's going to be true, but generally speaking, it, it should be fine. you have a different opinion? No, already? I agree. Okay. And John, how does Simply Thick affect the hydration of liquid? Uh, it, it doesn't affect it, meaning it's fully absorbable. Uh, that's a question. I think it was... It was a question way back, I don't know, about 20 years ago, people would 
mm-hmm. talk about that a lot. But there were a couple of studies done in the 2004, 2006 area that just showed that there was no difference in hydration regardless of the thickening agent. And let's talk ipsy testing a little bit. Do we have to do the pressure test for pureed consistency? Is it recommended? John, can you speak to this? I believe that the, the four pressure test is part of no, the, the IPSI here. test. That it's there for level cutting four. And we have it on the cutting board that... Uh, no, actually, I guess I'm wrong, right? I always I just... You, you, can, you can do make sure that you don't have lumps so you can put your fork onto the food to make sure there's no lumps and it's smooth. Yep, I, I just do it out of habit to mm-hmm. make sure it's soft and not cohesive and that, because when you push the fork in it, it, it should deform it and it shouldn't be hard to do. Right. There are some products that when you create a puree with them, it's too structured. Itsy wrote a, a whole article on the focus on purees about making sure that the food is not too restructured. How's that? Is that some preformed, um, it may not even be in the US, but some preformed purees may be too sticky and, and too, um, too firm, too firm. So they wouldn't really pass the test. So you, even, even your preformed purees, you want to test to make sure they actually pass. All right. Gave you an extra pause there. I wanted to make sure I didn't cut you off. <laughs> All right. Um, let me go ahead and see. Oh, you know what? This is a great linguistics question, actually. And I'm not sure, John or Lori, who would be better at answering this. So I'm just going to put it out there in the room and you can jump at it. I, but I do think this is a great question. Jean says, what does the phrase test in under ITSE framework mean? Are you saying testing one level below what you expect or something else? Great question. Did you understand that? No. Test under the ITSE. So why do we say under the ITSE framework rather than in the oh. ITSE? Oh, 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 okay. We're, we're getting picky. Uh, so, um, I, I, I think that's just the phrase I use, testing under the framework. Um, or testing I, in the framework, in you the could framework. say. Yeah, either way. I don't mean anything by it. Yeah. So to clarify, we don't, you don't, when we say test under, you don't have to worry about a level below. It just means within the framework. So that is just the phrase I believe that ITSE uses. Perhaps we made that up on our own, but that's the phrase that we've been using for several years. So apologies for any confusion. Let's talk supplements a little bit. John, does bringing in the fridge versus room temperature affect the consistency of Ensure? Oh, it's specific to Ensure. Uh, we believe that there's a difference whether it's refrigerated or served at room temperature. Um, believe most of our testing was done cold. Yes. And people have asked us to do some room temperature testing because they say supplements are left out bedside. Um, but because the tests are so long, we've, we've run them refrigerated. We do see a difference between them with a lot of supplements. It's not a significant difference, but so far we've only talked about refrigerated supplements in what we've released. So I don't want to comment on a specific supplement at this time. And with supplements in mind, does Ensure Clear Supplement thicken? So I think we can speak to this as far as thickening with Simply Thick. We cannot comment on other thickeners. John, can you tell us, does Ensure Clear Supplement thicken with Simply Thick? No. (laughs) Um, Basically, when these clear supplements came out, they generally have a fruity flavor. They've been acidified to create a, a fruity bite so to speak. And what that did is it moved the protein that's in there, the high protein from one state to another state. It switched the charge on the molecule from being negative to being positive. And when you go below that point with the protein, it becomes reactive to xanthan gum. Xanthan gum is negatively charged. When you get that protein and you make it positively charged, they jump together and it's a beautiful marriage in terms of chemistry, but not so good in terms of thickening or appealing to drink. So none of the xanthan-based thickeners w- will thicken that product. That's correct. Correct. That is a basic chemistry problem between xanthan gum and the proteins that the manufacturers are using in these supplements. Yes. 
So it doesn't matter if it's insure clear or boost breeze. Boost breeze. You're going to run into that where you have the clear high protein supplement with the low fruity taste. And Lori, let's talk about popsicles for a second. How about popsicles? Can a puree diet thin liquids have popsicles? Great, great question. So the popsicle that I showed you, for example, the watermelon juice, I thickened the watermelon juice to the allowable thickness. So I made mildly thick. I put one pump of Simply Thick into four ounces of watermelon juice or any juice. Oh, he's John is eating it. And then I froze it. So when it melts, it's going to melt back to mildly thick, for example, but you can make it any thickness that you want. Just make sure you thicken it and then freeze it. And they are good. They're very tasty. Yeah, I have to say uh, they are pretty good. I did an entire photo shoot with the Simply Thick Popsicles and even my dog loved them. Um, okay, I know we only have four minutes left, so I'm just going to do a couple more questions. That said, please feel free to continue sending in your questions. We do go ahead and email and answer you afterwards because um, we value your questions and we want to clarify as much as possible. So again, we'll do a couple more and then unfortunately we will have to wrap this up. Now, John, you mentioned this earlier. Oatmeal is not able to be pureed. What about cream of wheat? Great question. Uh, I don't have any experience with cream of wheat. Um, I know that oatmeal, when I make it, it's too sticky. Right. Uh, I've played with a couple different things to do it. I, I think it would depend on how you make the cream of wheat. Do you have any experience? With no, that? I don't. I believe I've heard it works, but I have not experimented with it. Okay. It's a great non-answer. Sorry. Yeah. It's okay. Non-answers just mean that we have more research to do, more experimentation, and perhaps the second edition of a cookbook and more recipes. All right. Final question. Unfortunately, this is our final question. And I think this is a great one. John, I'm going to turn this to you. I was originally taught slightly thick was for pediatric use, i.e. formula, breast milk, et cetera. Is that still correct? And is it not used or is it is it being used for adults and geriatrics? Okay, that that is sort of the history of slightly thick is that it came from the pediatric world. And that's where it was being used prior to ITSY. And we used to get calls for thicknesses. I didn't even know what they were. A quarter thick, half thick. Half nectar. Half nectar. Yeah. yeah it, it, and, and it was crazy. So, yes, it comes from the pediatric world, but it is part of the ITSY framework. The ITSY framework is appropriate for all ages. So just because... It came from the pediatric world does not mean that it's limited to there. So Slightly Thick is available for adults and geriatrics. Uh, it just has not taken off huge in the U.S. yet. Um, we took a risk and we created the Slightly Thick packet thinking that it would help people who are moving that way. And it is a product that's growing. And like I said, when I talked to some people in England a few years ago, they, were, they said it was already the, the most prescribed thickness they were giving out which kind of makes sense because we're just trying to give people the minimum amount mm -hmm. of thickness they need to control that beverage in their mouth. So I feel that speech therapists, when they begin to embrace it, will find that slightly thick is a great thickness for a lot of patients. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John and Lori. Unfortunately, we are at about time. So what we're going to do now is say goodbye to John and Lori. Thank you so much for all of the work that you've done. And we're going to go ahead and move into our housekeeping. But before that, I need a drum roll, please. We do have a raffle giveaway. You will be receiving a Simply Thick t-shirt and even better, a, an author signed copy of our Simply Thick cookbook. And the winner is Jill Boyette. Congratulations, Jill. We will be in touch with you regarding your prize. Now, last but not least, just some housekeeping and friendly reminders. You will be emailed a link to the recorded webinar for future viewing. Speech language pathologists and certified dietary managers will need to complete a quiz online in order to receive your CEUs. Quiz details and instructions were emailed to you. Registered dietitians and diet techs will receive certificates of completion for your files within one week. Please note, these emails are not sent out automatically. They will not be sent this evening. You will be receiving them either in the next day or early next week. If you are participating as a group and only one of you registered, you can contact us if you need additional certificates for those who participated. Please email us at itsy at simplythick.com. For more information about upcoming webinars, visit simplythick.com and check out our events board. 
Thank you for attending and have a wonderful rest of your week.